orthodoxy, right? And last week, my message was 30 minutes on why it's important to believe the right things. I'm going to recap. It's important to believe the right things. There we go. Recap is over. You don't even have to listen to it now, okay? So I talked on and on and on about that, and I hope it was good. Amen. You're glad you weren't there. Now, we're going to continue that with week two. What are some of those right things that you have to believe? I'm going to talk about the non-negotiables of salvation, okay? As we were watching the baptisms this morning, we, we really covered many of them. And I had a thought, actually, that, you know, if I had to pick an unstoppable movement that was going to last through all manner of persecution and spread to the entire world, it probably wouldn't have the outline that I'm going to share with you today, right? You wouldn't look at that belief system and be like, there's the one that just will endure no matter what, you know? But we have a thing called the Holy Spirit who is enabling people to believe it, right? And he's going to be working on everyone here this morning. So there may or may not be a response time afterwards. There will. Okay. So non-negotiables of salvation. What do you have to believe, have to believe, in order to be saved? I'm not going to go over all of the truths in the Bible. We don't have time for that. You know, I'm not even going to talk about all of the non-negotiable truths in the Bible. We don't have time for that either. Just the stuff that you have to believe in order to be a Christian. Okay? And I think that that's very important for two reasons. One is that there are all kinds of interesting people in the world that believe all kinds of interesting stuff and do all kinds of interesting things. And I don't know if it's a Western thing, or a modern thing, or an American thing, or what, but when they do surveys and they ask all these different types of people what religion they are, so many of them are like, yeah, I guess I'm a Christian. That's, like, do you even know what that means, you know? And the answer to that so often is no. People do not have an understanding of what it means at the most fundamental level to be a Christian. To be saved. That's the first reason I think it needs to be addressed. Because there's confusion. And the second reason is because I think that when you've been in church your entire life like I have, and you had a mom that made you go to church, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, sometimes on Friday, if it's a revival, every day, all day, you know, <laughs> you start to think salvation is as simple to other people who haven't heard it before as it is to you. And I don't think that's the case. Check it out. If you ask somebody, what does it mean to be a Christian? We said it this morning. We explained it. This isn't a slam. You know, but so often we go right here. Uh, like what, what Paul and Silas, I believe, said to the jailer, right? He's like, what do I have to do to be saved? And they say to him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And so often Christians are content to say, well, see, there you go. It's simple. But if it was that simple, why would the next verse be, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. What more was there to say? And you might wonder after reading and finding out that this lasted most of the night, right, that there was a lot to say. So what are they talking about if it's just as simple as believing in Jesus and then you're saved? Maybe there's more to it. And I'm going to argue that there is. Uh, another great verse to talk about just the bare essentials of salvation, Romans 10. It was quoted this morning. So true. Here's Romans 10, 9 and 10, 13, back to back. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Simple. And for us who have grown up in the church, we're content to leave it there. And it's like, well, what, what's the issue? You know? But you read verse 14 and it says this. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Preaching entails a heck of a lot more than saying, You, I need you to believe there's a student named Jesus. Can you believe that? Okay, can you believe that God raised him from the dead? You're all good. You, I need you to believe, right? And on and down the line. It's not quite that simple. And if you put your mind in the place of someone that's never heard this before, it becomes obvious that there are a ton of questions, right? If somebody were to say to you, believe that Jesus was raised from the dead by God and you're saved, they might start to bring out the necessary truths of salvation with their questions. Like, you keep saying God. Which God are you talking about? Come on, clicker, don't fail me now. You keep mentioning this guy named Jesus. There we go. Who is Jesus? I mean, that was a really common name back in the day. Yeshua would be like Josh. Like, you've been saved by Josh from Pawpaw. 
Like, what are you talking about? Right? And then you keep saying saved. Uh, saved from what? I was unaware that I'm in any danger. And then saved how? Because some guy I don't know died? Like, you need to explain some things to me because I'm missing a lot. Right? I think all of that entails the word of the Lord that they had to preach and explain to people. Does that make sense? And here's a bonus. I don't think you have to believe this in order to be saved, but we grow in realizing it, and it is the best of the good news, and that is the why. Why are you saved? Why any of this other stuff? And we're going to close there. Does that sound good? All right, let's dive in. The very first thing that you've got to believe, a non-negotiable, if you want to be saved, is that you've got to believe that there is one God. That seems like a no-brainer to us. But if you were to go back in time, say to Rome, where Jesus was actually preaching, you would find out that if you asked them about the gods, there would be a bunch, right? And we're all pretty familiar with this. There's, you know, Jupiter and Neptune and Venus and Mars and they all have personalities. You know, they exist in this society of the gods and they've got varying temperaments and sometimes they're fighting with each other and sometimes they're not fighting with each other and you don't want to get on the good side of one and on the bad side. It's very complicated, right? And they're all fighting for your attention and fighting for your loyalty in Roman culture. Same deal in the Greek culture that came just before them. Different names for basically the same things. You talk about God and gods, you got a bunch. All with different personalities. All of them can be kind of a problem, you know, if they're having a bad day. Uh, you go up to the, the Norse regions, right? You've got Norse mythology, now made popular by Marvel. We're going to split the church right now, by the way. Thor people, show of hands. Loki people, show of hands. Okay. Everyone who didn't raise their hand for Loki is lying. He's all of our favorites. No, I'm just kidding. Like, we feel bad about it, but it's okay. No. <laughs> so... But he's a problem, right? These are these gods, quote unquote, they all have their own little territories, they're temperamental, they're issues, you know? And this is common all throughout history. Go back in time to the Babylonian gods, they're, they're kind of crazy. Uh, Ishtar down there at the bottom can't even afford a dress. I had to censor her, I'm sorry. Uh, and if you go back in time even farther than that to Egypt, the Egyptian gods are like, they take the cake for weird. Are we all seeing Crocodile Man there at the bottom? That is so strange, right? But this was normal. Throughout history, this kind of thing was normal. And yet it's completely normal to us now that we have one God who has no image, right? Fast forward to 2019 in America, we're totally okay with this. You go back in time, literally anywhere else, and that's weird, man. Does that make sense? So something has happened. We can all get behind this idea that there's one God, but this was a hard-won truth for the world to accept. We're going to talk about some interesting Bible passages real quick. Very first of the Ten Commandments is... Anybody? Pastor Bill? There you go. That's right. You shall have... Thank you, Dan Seer. That's right. You shall have no other gods before me. So many Bibles translate it this way. Does anyone see a potential issue with this verse? Dan, you want to rescue us? Yeah, it kind of implies that there might be other gods, right? It's kind of like God saying, don't pay attention to those other gods. Focus here, right? And as good Christians, we kind of skip right by that without thinking about how the original audience might have heard that. It doesn't get better in other translations. Here's one from the GNT. Worship no God but me. Like, that's worse, right? That's pretty much telling you there's other gods out there that you could worship, but focus here. Guys, focus here. I want to be your God. Pick me. Ooh, ooh, right? And then the message translation kind of tries to skirt it, I think, by saying, no other gods, only me. Very clever, Eugene Peterson. But that, that still kind of implies, for you, no other gods, only me. For you, right? Now, here's the interesting thing. The people in the Old Testament would have called any supernatural being, any spiritual being with any amount of power, a god. Okay? The Bible does indeed teach that there are supernatural beings. Some of them are quite powerful. But there's a difference. And Yahweh has to speak into the culture that is calling all of these weird spiritual things gods, and he has to differentiate himself. You know how he does that? by making himself the biggest, baddest, peerless, 
God that there is. When he goes to Abram, who is a pagan, who comes out of this culture, right, with tons of gods, and introduces himself, God does something very intentional in Genesis 17. And he says, Abram, I am God Almighty. Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And the Old Testament paints this picture of Yahweh, not as one among many, but as the only one and creator of all. He came from nowhere. He created everything. He is competitionless. He is the greatest. And any other spiritual entity that would dare call itself a god is a poser and will be judged by him. Does that make sense? Now, this is just our definition of what we call a god. Does that make sense? We've changed our definition. The being that is almighty, that is the creator, that calls the shots, from whom everything else came, that's God and nothing else is. Does that make sense? Millard Erickson sums it up this way in his Christian theology. And I like it. So here it is. God is personal, all-powerful, eternal, spirit, present everywhere within his creation, and unchanging in his perfection. By this definition, there are this many. One. If you're going to be a Christian, you must believe that there is one God. Are we good so far? Excellent. Let's move on. Second thing you've got to believe, or you are not in fact a Christian, is a divine Jesus. Has to be divine. This is our questioner. I picked him from Google because he looks like Reuben from Vandalia. I was like, it's just too good. I got to do it. So the whole divine Jesus thing, people get hung up on this. They really, really do. And that is not new. It's very old that people would say, hey, okay, I can hang with this one God thing, this all-powerful creator thing. Maybe I can even hang with this Savior thing. But God in the flesh, I had a seminary professor that would say, professor that would say God in a bod. Like, God in a bod? I don't know about that, right? He believed it. He was just making a funny rhyme because he's a funny dude. But this is such an old idea that you may have heard of the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was written to combat the lie that Jesus was not divine. There was this guy running around named Arius who was convincing people that Jesus was the greatest of all created beings. But he was a created being. The early church got together in the early 300s and they said, man, we've got to put the kibosh on this because you cannot be a Christian unless you believe, we'll zoom in on the first paragraph, that you believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God, that's Jesus, from true God, begotten, not made, and consubstantial with the Father. And that fancy word there is very important. It means of the same stuff, of the same substance, the same God essence that makes God God, makes Jesus Jesus. It's the same. If you don't believe that, you are not a Christian. And we'll talk about why that's so important later. You must believe in one God. You must believe that Jesus was that one God in the flesh. How are we doing? Good. Some of the reasons that people don't believe in a divine Jesus is that they mistakenly believe the Bible never says that Jesus was God. But it does. Let's go to the obvious place in John chapter 1. Here we go. John 1, 1 to 3 and 14. In the beginning was the Word. He's leading with this, by the way. This is the opening of his book. So is it kind of important? It is pretty important. And the Word was with God. And the Word, help me out, was God. Thank you. He was with God in the beginning and through him were made and through him all things were made. Without him, the word, nothing was made that has been made. So he's saying the word isn't just God. This is the creator God. This is the one, guys. It's the same. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. That's talking about Jesus. John is saying, the very first thing I want you to know is that this guy isn't just Josh, Josh from Pawpaw, right? It's not just Yeshua from Nazareth. This is God in the flesh, the maker of all things, who for some reason that I'm about to explain to you, because I'm writing a long book, 
decided to come to earth and live with you. Pay attention. You would be paying attention with an intro like that, would you not? So the next pushback is that while John may say that, certainly Jesus never explicitly claimed to be God. But he did. The first century Jews that he was talking to knew their Old Testament. So they heard things differently than we do, partly because we don't know our Old Testament quite as well. But that was the world they lived in, was the Old Testament. I mean, they viewed their whole existence through the lens of their scriptures. So when Jesus in John chapter 10 says this, I am the good shepherd, they hear something kind of extreme. Let me continue. John 10, 11 to 14. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. Somebody say scatters. scatters. Thank you so much. I love that. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. If you were a first century Jew and Jesus would have stood up and said that, you would have freaked out because you would have known the great prophet Ezekiel wrote this in Ezekiel 34. After talking about how the leaders of Israel are terrible shepherds and judging them, Ezekiel writes this from the Lord. Ezekiel 34, 11 to 13. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them. So will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered. I will bring them out from the nations. I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel. This is Yahweh in the Old Testament saying, leaders of my people, you stink at your job. You're not even worthy to be called shepherds. I'm going to have to come down there and do this myself. Fast forward to the New Testament. This guy, Josh from Papa, Jesus from Nazareth, sorry, steps up and says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm here to rescue my scattered sheep. What do they hear? That's crazy. We know that they were just totally bothered by this because Jesus won't let it go, right? Later in the chapter, he talks to him again and he picks up the sheep analogy yet again. He's, he knows he's getting them, man, and he's just like egging them on. Jesus says this in John 10, 29 to 30. My father who has given them, that's the sheep, to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. He just all but came out and said, I am Yahweh. Israel is Yahweh's sheep. Israel are my sheep. How did I get them? Because the father gave them to me. How can he do that? We're the same. And we know that that's what these first century Jews heard because they immediately pick up rocks to kill Jesus. <laughs> and when Jesus says, what are you doing? What I do that was so bad? They say this, we're not stoning you for any good work, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So if you meet anyone who says that Jesus never claimed to be God, it isn't because Jesus never claimed to be God. It's because they are not a first century Jew. Because that's exactly what they heard, and eventually that's why they crucified him. Amen? Alright, so you've got to believe in one God. You've got to believe in a divine Jesus. The next thing, now we're getting into the bad news, good news part. Okay, there's a tiny Baptist, for those of you that don't know, named Daryl, who lives in my heart. Okay? <laughs> this part of the sermon is going to make him very happy. Okay? Saved from what? This is the bad news that you must believe to fully appreciate and embrace the good news. You must believe that you are a sinner. In Romans, Paul says this, Romans 3, 22 to 24, righteousness is given through faith. Pause right there. Righteousness is given. It is not the default setting. It's given through faith. If you haven't been given it, you don't have it. Sorry, I told you this was the bad news. Righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 
There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Pause again. There were tons of differences between Jews and Gentiles. That was literally everybody in the world. But there's no difference here. None of them started righteous. Right? And everybody has sinned. In this area, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. We're all in the same boat. 24, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This state of being not only people who do wrong stuff, but people who by our very nature trend towards bad stuff. It's like, you ever had a car that was out of alignment and that sucker just wants to veer into oncoming traffic, right? It's like, that's what we're fighting in our sin nature, you know? It's like, we're just bent that way, man. Like a frame of a car can be bent towards destruction, you know what I mean? And something needs to be done. This is obvious. And yet, this guy, Malcolm Muggridge, who I don't know much about, but I do know that Robbie Zacharias loves him, and that is good enough for me. <laughs> Robbie's always ripping off this quote from Malcolm. I guess he's not ripping it off. He gives him credit. But here we go. The depravity of man, that's our sinful state, is at once the most empirically verifiable reality, but at the same time the most intellectually resisted fact. We don't want to admit that the frame is bent, that we are veering towards destruction, we're depraved. We don't just do bad stuff, we want to do bad stuff. We are driven to be selfish, selfish and self-seeking, and to sabotage others and to feel nasty feelings. It's obvious to all of us, right, because we know our thoughts, right? <laughs> but it should also be obvious because we see what other people do, you know, but we resist this idea that we are depraved sinners. I think because somewhere deep inside, we know what that means. If you scoot just past the most famous verse in the Bible, you'll find these two gems. And remember, we're in the bad news portion of the good news. Okay. John three eighteen to 36. Jesus says this. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is just fine. No. Stands condemned already. Not only did you not start righteous, you're in a state of condemnation already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Later, I believe it's John the Baptist says this, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Not comes as a result of their disbelief, but is there by default. Last week at Vine, we talked about how some people want to believe that everything is just fine. You know, the atheist argument, which is basically like, we die, that's it, who cares? Let's just enjoy the ride, right? Let's not make trouble for people. You know, we only get one shot. Enjoy your life, because when you take the dirt nap, everything just kind of fades away. You try to convince yourself that stuff is fine, but the picture the Bible paints is that you were born here. And you are going to deny that and things are going to come to their inevitable conclusion, or you're going to acknowledge it and be saved. Does that make sense? You get saved from a burning plane. Okay? Things don't sort themselves out when it looks like that. I hope they're okay. I don't know where that picture came from. I feel a little bad. Bless them. Okay. Guys, that's the bad news. I had a seminary professor that said, if you've never looked at yourself in the mirror, this is important. It shocked me, but I believe it. If you've never looked at yourself in the mirror and said, there's a person that deserves to go to hell, I don't know if you're a Christian. I chewed on that for a long time. I found this article. I'm going to use a quote from John Piper. Everybody say, oh, lots of people don't like John Piper. You're allowed not to like him, okay? But he still gets to be right about what he's right about. And he's right about this. A person that doesn't believe he's a sinner cannot be saved. If there is nothing to forgive, Jesus didn't do anything for me. If he didn't do anything for me, I'm not believing in him for salvation. And if I'm not believing in him for salvation, I am not saved. So you must believe that you are a sinner. Under the wrath of God, currently. Already condemned. Is that bad news? You guys ready for some good news? Okay, good. One God, divine Jesus, you're a sinner. The next thing that you've got to believe if you want to be a Christian, it is a non-negotiable, is that you have to believe in the atonement. 
Fancy word. Can you define that? Of course, because I know how to get to blueletterbible.org. Here we go. Outline of biblical usage. Atonement. <laughs> uh, shameless. Atonement is an exchange... And of the business of money changers, it means exchanging equivalent values, an adjustment of a difference, reconciliation, restoration to favor. And then they sum it up this way in the New Testament. It's used of the restoration of the favor of God to sinners that repent and put their trust in the expiatory death of Christ. That basically means your guilt is removed if it's been expiated. Something about the death of Christ removes our guilt cancels the debt. All of this stuff, the, the, the exchanging of valuable things that are equivalent, right? The removal of a debt, the restoration to favor for a sinner, all of that is happening while this is happening, right? That, again, the only reason that doesn't seem insane to us is because we've heard it so much. But it's still true. A guy from a little town was actually God, and he died to pay the price for the sins of mankind. This brings us to why Jesus has to be divine. I have to give John Piper a nod for this as well, because I, I don't know how I missed this psalm literally my entire life. Why couldn't a person have died for people? Why not Jesus just being a really good guy, right? Not divine. And we actually find the answer in the psalms. Psalm 49, 7 to 9, and 15. No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly and no payment is ever enough so that they should live on forever and not see decay. Skip down to verse 15. But God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. A perfect person at best which is impossible, but at best could only pay their own way. What kind of sacrifice, what kind of exchange would you offer for generation upon generation, billions of depraved sinners? There's only one I can think of, and that is the perfect life of God himself. And this is what he offers, and that's what the atonement is. In Romans, Paul talks about it like this, Romans 5, 7-9. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though a good person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, this is the good news, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, that's the atonement. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? It no longer remains on you through him. Is that good news? That is good news, man. It's really good. And if, if you look close, well, let me just say this. Where, where are we right now? Okay? We have one God who's all-powerful, who has no competition, who's beat the crap out of every other poser God, right? Who people continue to stab in the back because they suck. I don't know another way to put it, right? They're depraved sinners. So he decides... I know what I'll do. I'll come to earth as a human and be murdered for them. Does that make sense to anyone at all? But we see a clue here as to why God might choose to do that. And that brings us to our bonus theological fact. Are you guys ready for this? This is the close. Here we go. What do you have to believe to be a Christian? One God. Divine Jesus. You are a sinner. The atonement took care of that. But here's a freebie. Okay? You don't necessarily need this to be saved, but man, oh man, this is what moved me to be saved. The divine motivator is love. The most famous verse in the Bible is the most famous verse for a very good reason. It tells the truth. And I've heard some salty professors try to tell me that Jesus didn't die for you because he loved you. He was just being obedient to the Father. I'm like, okay, stop. Why? Why are you doing this? You know, that can be true while this is true. John 3.16. If you know it, say it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Amen, dude. Here's a challenge if you struggle to believe that. 
I'm seriously offering this challenge. Seriously take it and get back to me when you complete it. Step one, read the entire Bible. Sounds extreme, but I'm serious. And then try to figure out a way that the plot of that story makes sense if it's not a love story. Try to make it work, logically, and I don't think you can. Justice isn't a good enough motivator for that story. If it was all about justice, we would have just been squashed. Adam and Eve would have sinned, reset button, done. Why does he care? Why does he care? Why did he do any of this stuff? It's got to be a love story. And who does he love? People in general? Yes. But Bill, this guy, maybe Nick, all of us, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's mildly inappropriate. I apologize. <laughs> Guys, that's good news. I'm going to recap real quick, and then I'm going to have a response time, okay, before I hand it off to Marilee. These are the non-negotiables of salvation. You must believe this to be saved. There is one God, Yahweh, the all-powerful, who has no competition, who made everything. Got to believe it. He has no competition. Two, Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh who came because people are sinful and depraved and bent towards evil and he loves them and wanted to pay the price of his own life so that you could have relationship with him again. That is what you must believe to be a Christian. So here's going to be the response time. And if nobody takes me up on this, it's no skin off my back. It's absolutely fine. But did Jesus do some bold, costly, painful things for us? Yes. So with every eye open and every head up, if you believe that today, and this is your first time, I'm going to give you five seconds. I want you to respond by standing up, and I just want to pray and bless you. Nobody has to do it, but if that's you, take the opportunity to stand for Jesus. Five, four, three, two, one. It appears that we are a room full of Christians or chickens. So, I'm sorry, that was also mildly uncalled for, was it not? Guys, if you believe that and you want to pray with someone, we have a prayer team available. I'm not going to go through that right now, but please respond. I believe that this is the word of the Lord that Paul spoke to people, that the missionary spoke to people. That is the explanation. And if you believe that, you are saved. Amen? Amen. Here's Bill to close.